Hi my friend, in this video we're going to be making a soulful house song inspired by Fisher's song, World Hold On. And we're going to find out if we can do this in under 6 hours by using the 80-20 rule of house music production. What you're listening to right now is the song we'll be working on. And what you're looking at right now is the Ableton project file that we'll be working on. We'll be going through each layer in the original order I followed when making this, covering the drums, bass, melodic elements, and final structure, so you can follow along yourself. Stick around to the end of the video for a full recap of the 80-20 rule, so you can apply everything you learn in this video as quickly as possible to your own productions. Because all in all, this only took me about six hours to finish, and as you can see, it's completely arranged, mixed, mastered, and is ready to be used in DJ sets and sent out to labels. So if finishing songs fast like this is something you'd like help with, I've made you a free bundle of templates, samples, and special bonuses that I use to completely finish a song like this every single week. Visit the link that's on screen now or in the description to grab your copy of the Ultimate Song Finishing Toolkit for free. And if you want to take things to the next level, you can also find a link to this video's project files, as well as over 30 full project files based on tracks from the Beatport Top 100 charts, with new files being added weekly. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. All right, so this is a look at the project file page for this one. And the very first thing I'll do whenever starting any tune is first I'll figure out the reference track. So in this instance, we're doing Fisher's rework of World Hold On. And the reason I picked this one is because honestly, I really, really like the track. I can't remember if it was in like the Beatport Top Charts, but I'm sure it was because this, this is a really awesome tune. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll find some particular information about this. So this one is in the key of A flat minor, and it's in the tempo, the BPM of 127 beats per minute. And this I all found from the Beatport page. Um, then the second thing, once I have that reference track, is I'll find a different hook that I want to have in mind while I'm building out the reference track. And this is so that as I'm building out each layer of this reference track, I'm not only listening to the reference track to figure out these layers, but I'm also listening to this new hook. And this is going to help make it so that the the reference track that you're making or the track that you're building at the reference track isn't just a super carbon copy of it because you're also taking cues from this new hook and letting this hook guide you in a direction to ultimately make something a bit more unique and original and something that you could actually release instead of just having like a nice carbon copy in your like Ableton projects, right? You know, I think the idea is to have something that you can, you can work with here that just is a professional standard and that's why we use the reference track. So in this instance, I've been really into remixes. Um, so what I chose is this new song, newish song from Jungle called Let's Go Back. And the reason I pick this is I believe the week that I was making this, this was a brand new track. So I will take a look at like billboard re like releases to see what's new on New Music Friday and stuff like that. And Jungle is an a artist that's really awesome. They have this really cool kind of old school sound. So whenever they put out something, I'm interested in it. So this automatically sounded cool. And then what I, I'll do next is well, first the reference track, then you want to figure out the hook. And the last step before actually jumping into the doll and getting into things is finding a relationship between the two. So for this track, it's in the key of A minor and the tempo is, uh, the BPM is, is just 72. So when it comes to the key, you can see that they're, they're not in the same key, but clearly I can like pitch the vocal down or I can pitch the reference up as I'm building up those layers to have them in the same key. So there's a pretty strong relationship there. Very easy to get these two in line to sound good. When it comes to the BPM, they're not super similar. So this one's 72, this one's 127. But one thing about lower BPMs that you can do is you can multiply this by two. So this would, you can imagine it as 144. And 144 BPM to 127 BPM is a little bit closer. So there is something of a relationship, but if you're doing something with very different BPMs like this, you might run into trouble. You can get kind of like that Alvin and the Chipmunks kind of sound with the vocals or it sounds too low and slow and weird. So that's something you want to keep in mind when you're trying to pick the two. And also another little tip that I like to do is you can actually play these two back, uh, back to back or put them both in your DAW and kind of overlap them, create like a makeshift quick little mashup. So you can hear them together and make that decision of does this sound good together. And then ultimately, this little bit of prep work is really going to be that thing that allows you to really produce with confidence knowing that the end result is going to be good because you've kind of looked into the future and figured out some using some music theory and some of your own intuition to decide if this is going to work. So 
with that out of the way, before we actually jump into Ableton, there's one more extra thing I want to show you just to keep in mind, because I've been talking about that 80-20 rule thing. So there's, I want you to keep that in mind when you're, when we're looking into these layers. So one of the first things is we're going to be switching back and forth between that reference track and the track that we're building to make the decisions. If you need any help on that, I have a video here on how to set that up correctly. And there will be a link in the description as well with the playlists of just YouTube videos that I've made to give you a bit more information on how to set that up and how it works. And then the other thing is, as you're building out each layer, focusing on the three things that are going to give you the most impact. So that is the pattern. So whatever notes are being played or whatever drum hits are being played and when. The next is the sound selection of what you're choosing, whether it's a synth or the specific drum sample. And lastly, the big thing is setting up volumes. Setting up your volume close to the reference track is really going to be that 80-20 real killer there. Um, you don't have to do any crazy processing or anything like that. But then the other thing is to keep in mind is that I use a lot of these one knob Ableton racks and like custom channel strip stuff all available if you want to grab that in the project file. And it does make things a lot easier. So with that said, now let's jump into Ableton. So this is a look at the project file. I'll zoom out so you can kind of have a full look at it. Right here we have the reference track. I've changed it to mine. Um, and then what we have is the structure track above. And this is going to be super helpful when we get into the finishing process, when we're actually structuring and arranging it. Right now let's go over the layers. So first things first is let's have a listen to, let me just turn everything off and we'll have a listen to the vocal first. So this is the first thing that I put in there. Like I said, having that in there to really help make your decisions is going to make it not sound as a uh, carbon copy. -y. So this is a quick listen to the vocal. So Nothing too crazy going on here. Let's have a look if I did anything. I think I just pitched it down one semitone so that it was in line with the other track and played around with it in Complex Pro to make it sound a little bit less uh, kind of choppy, I suppose you would say. Um, it's very heavily sidechained. So I have some, some one of the ones on sidechain here. We're moving a bit of the lows. We're making room for the kick and the bass there to take up that area. A little bit of this compressor just to keep the, the, the sound nice. Uh, kind of a sim simple... Um, the, the dynamic range is, is more contained basically is the idea there. Um, and that's really it. One could argue there's maybe too much sidechain going on here, but I think it sounds cool in the context of the track. Um, once that is in there, then I usually will start with the drums, um, starting off with the kick. So let's have a look and listen to that. I'm going to turn off the vocal to copyright reasons. And that way we're not getting distracted by a human voice. So in this one, uh, it's basically just this classic like four on the floor kick kind of idea. Um, and I've set up my template, which you can check out the video for that as well, to automatically have these notes in here. Because the thing is, with the MIDI for the kick and a lot of these drum parts, they're usually in the same spot. So you can save a bunch of time by having your MIDI pattern also prepared as well, in addition to having like your drum racks prepared, which we'll get into in a second. But mainly it's a four on the floor kick pattern with these extra little kind of ghosty notes, accent notes kind of just adding a little bit of like rhythm. So that's a look at the pattern. In terms of the sound, what I've done in this instance is um, use this little rack that I made here to uh, extract the kick. So what I've done is just at the intro of the song. Oh, and also I should say I extracted this vocal by using a like a stem separator thing. But the <laughs> back out of the, to the kick, um, basically what I did is just use the intro of the song to find a section where the, the, the kick was playing by itself. And then just dialed in some of these options here to kind of isolate it a bit more. I have a new way of doing that. So check out some of the other videos that I've been posting recently. There's a really cool program called Drum Clone that can just extract things. But this old school way of, of grabbing the kick, this is where it can be helpful to have this structure track in here. Because then you can just quickly find the intro or outro of the tune to find a kick where it's isolated and then snatch that. So in this instance, what we're doing is just taking the kick. Sometimes I'll use that similar sound function. So you can, I think you can uh, click on the, the waveform here and then press uh, show in finder or show similar samples. And you could find something that sounds very similar to that kick in your own library, which is also a really nice technique, but sometimes it's nice to just steal it. Um, and then other than that, a little bit of drum bus dialed in at 70%. We're adding a bit of boom to add some kind of like sub low end to it. And then we're rolling off a bit of the highs. Other than that, there's an EQ8 here that is simply being used to, uh, you can see here, there's an automation here. It's just more of an, an arrangement or structure technique. 
to sometimes take out the lows of the kick. And so that's like a more of a structure technique that happens throughout the track. Next up is to move on to the drums. So let's go ahead and have a look at have a look and listen. The idea here is starting with the kick and then as you're flicking back and forth between your track and the reference track, that's how you're going to decide what the pattern is, what the choosing the right sounds and then choosing the right volumes. And the idea is to just be like, I usually go kick and then I'll go through the drums and kind of listen to what element is sticking out the most to me because that is probably the element that's having the, the strongest impact on the drum sound um, in this case, because we're looking at drums. So for me, I was hearing this clap. So let's go ahead and have a look and listen to that over here. This is really weird kind of clap sound, actually. I think I would, um, basically it's just hitting on the two and four like any kind of snare. So this is most likely reinforcing the snare sound. And what I just have here is I've used a little pre-selected group of drum sounds that I have. So this is something I'd recommend doing too. Uh, set up your drum racks for your claps and your kicks and whatever to have a bunch of your favorite samples in here. So you're not always looking through like hundreds of samples. So you're kind of looking through the five or ten that you really like the most. And then you're kind of also developing a signature sound by kind of starting to to rely on the, some of these similar sounds. Uh, in terms of the pattern, it's just, yeah, uh, on the two and the four. Something I like to do is layer up multiple claps, claps. So have one a little bit more left, one a little bit to the right, and then potentially having different claps coming in uh, at different points. Um, this way, it's, there's a little bit more of a humanization kind of effect um, and just keeps things interesting for the listener because there's slight variations of that sound happening. Um, other than that, a little bit of processing. We're moving a bunch of the lows to make room for the, the kick. This is the cha standard channel strip that I have to make mixing as you go super simple. That way you're just quickly dialing in some EQ, a little transient shaping, a little sidechain saturation and width. We'll go over that in a video as well, the template video, so check that out. Um, grooving some kit of that, and we're moving a lot of sustain, so it's a really tight sound. A little bit of saturation to make it pop out a little bit more, and then some width to make it a little bit of a wider sound. Uh, the next, and then again, main thing is flicking back and forth between the reference to dial in the volume. Now let's let's into the next element, which was the snare. So this again is happening very similar in terms of the patterns so of the two, four, two, four. So again, it's nice to have your template set up so it's already that like that there for you. What I did is just flick between my samples here. So there's a couple things you can do: flicking back and forth between the reference. Uh, and then just going up and down with your arrow keys like that is a is a is a good option. But I've also set up so you can do it with this little selector here. Um, these two are really working together to overall create the sound. Um, and then in terms of any processing, just removing some lows. That's really it. Main thing was dialing in the volume. Next thing I heard was this hat sound. So let's go ahead and have a listen to that. So the idea here is really similar. What I want you to do is follow along here because it looks com more complicated than it is. The first sound that I'll always go for, with, particularly with a closed hat, is this offbeat pattern here that I've highlighted. So it's this offbeat pattern, right? So the template I have will set that up automatically. That's going to usually be a pretty core like part of the hi-hat sound, particularly with open hats as well. So the idea is to get that down first. And then you add in additional notes around it to kind of create that shuffle and that groove. So in this instance, this kind of little skippy bit is kind of what I was hearing when I was referencing the track. The idea is to have kind of this one sound here playing a little bit with like the ghost notes. So it's not hitting super hard all the time. It's kind of humanization as like an actual drummer would do it. And then throwing in some other hat sounds to also kind of create that humanization effect. So you're hearing kind of different sounds at different velocities and it's making it sound a little bit more interesting and awesome. Uh, that's the idea there. So I, hopefully that simplifies the pattern a lot. Other than that, the sound is I flicked back and forth between the the reference and my little library of closed hat sounds. Um, again, I'd recommend creating your own little library of your go to's there. So you're not always having to dig through a crazy library and then just some simple mixing as you go with the channel strip. So removing some lows, tidying up the sound by moving some of the sustain. And that's really it. Main thing is dialing in the volume. The next element that I added in was the open hi-hat. So let's have a look and listen to that. So in terms of the pattern, you can see again, it's that classic like hat and open hat pattern. So it's on the offbeat here. 
And in this instance, I just found like I really needed to layer up quite a bit. I think there was kind of a lot of high end going on and like a body and it sounded like it was just like a layered open hat sound. So I started off with one and then slowly added in additional ones as I needed to. Um, let's have a look at, so that was the sound. And then in terms of like any other processing here, main thing is the volumes again, but then some mixing as you go stuff going on here. So removing some of the lows again, it's not really needed, making room for the bass and the kick. Uh, what we are doing is dialing back the attack a bit so that open hat isn't hitting as hard. Some of the attack, because we also have the, the, the closed hat hitting too, some of the attacks coming in from that. So that's something that I've been playing with. And then removing some sustain so it's a little bit tighter, adding some saturation so it's a little grittier and um, a little bit fuller sounding. One additional thing is, you'll notice this is again more of an arrangement trick, but on the open hat here, I'll color code the hats or like any of these clips if there's like variations in the sound. So the darker color is the open hats hitting harder. And then these lighter ones, there's just less layers playing on these ones as you can see here. So that's another way to kind of increase and decrease energy throughout the track. Um, then the core principle that I always have with this is to first start off with your core sounds. And these are going to be like those MIDI sounds that we're punching in and using like our sounds from our library. Uh, things like the kick and the clap and the hats and the open hats. Once those core sounds are in, I like to then add in like top loops or like breaks to add some extra character and humanization and uniqueness to the rest of the sound. It can sound a little too sterile when it's like just this. And like amateur, I feel like it's a, a nice way to add some extra character and professionalism when you're start adding in all these additional more audio loops, basically. So let's start working through those. The next first one that I was really hearing in the track was the shaker sounds. So let's have a listen. Solo it for a second. And back in it. This is adding a ton of groove, really characteristic of the actual tune. Uh, what we're doing, nothing crazy here, just dropped it in. I think I found it on Splice potentially. Um, in terms of any processing, we're just removing a whole bunch of the lows, a little bit of sidechain so it has that pumping effect and it's making room for the kick, and a little bit of this width so it's going left and right and getting a little bit um, like pushed to the sides a little bit more, making room for everything in the middle. You also, if you want to see a detail of like what's inside this, it's all free plugins and, and stock stuff uh, and how and why it's being used in this way. Definitely check out that template video that we have in the playlist and also on the project file page. Main thing, though, is to then uh, just dial in the uh, volume, just flicking back and forth again to the reference to make sure that the volume is somewhat similar to the reference track um, and taking slowly taking creative liberties as you see fit. Like you want to start by following the reference and then slowly as you're building out the track more and more following your intuition and making changes that aren't exact from the reference track. Next up is adding in one of these breaks. So let's have a listen to this. Well, let's solo it out. So pretty subtle stuff, right? I think it's all about really just layering in small amounts of this to add a bit of extra character to your core sounds. It's not to overtake them. So in this instance, I found this wizard break. I'm not sure where. It's a weird RX file. Not sure about that either. But one thing that I did do was what you can do is uh, on audio files, if it's on preserve, set to transient, set it so it's uh, this right thing pointing to the right. And you can tighten this up by pulling it to the left. And it'll basically like the sustain of a lot of these notes will be removed. And I feel like that's a nice way to kind of have it blend in with your core sounds because it's a lot tighter of a sound. It's taking up less sonic space and uh, it's less apparent. It blends in a bit more. Um, in terms of any processing on this one, again, key thing is dialing in the volume. And in these, um, subtlety is really the idea. It's reinforcing the core loops, not taking it over, like I said. Uh, any little mix as you go processing, we're removing some lows, so it's making room for the kick of the bass. And then a bit of um, full, like, cutting out the highs. And then a little shelving, so, like, the medium, like, the mid highs are also being tamed as well. A lot of more sculpting to have it, again, emphasize the core hits little side chain so it's pumping a little bit with to push to the left and right um that's a look at that one the next loop that i added in was this one let's have a listen to it all in context and then let's have a listen to it by itself so again subtlety here is the kind of main thing i think i found this by looking up breaks on splice to find some of these loops um main thing is volume after you found the pattern and um, the sound 
and then and we're just removing some lows, shelving out a little bit of highs, a little bit of side chain, a little bit of wit. Um, that's pretty much a good look at the drums. So now let's move on to the next elements. Uh, in this instance, for some reason, I usually do bass after drums, but for some reason, I did the melodic stuff. Um, so let's have a look at, at this. And one thing I do want to keep in mind is I'm going to keep the vocal off, but particularly once working on the more melodic stuff, like the bass and the synths and all that kind of stuff, um, you really want to listen to it in context with that hook element. If it's a remix, if it's a vocal, if it's whatever it is, building out your melodic stuff to that main hook is super important to make sure that it does sound more unique and you're building out something that you can actually use, in my opinion. If that's what you want to do, that's what I recommend doing. But So the main thing here was finding this, like, I think it's just this, like, uh, organ -y kind of sound that's in the original track. So let me just turn all this off so we can slowly start adding everything in. Um, boom, 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 boom. And we'll kind of just go through this real quick. Let me turn it on. So it's that, that kind of like little bouncy mel melodic kind of bit. Um, so let's go over some things. First, I believe the way that I found this uh, pattern is just I dragged the track into this empty MIDI track, and that does the audio to MIDI function, which will give you a rough idea of what the notes are and what the pattern is. Um, more information on that bass video that I have, if you want to check out the playlist or over on the project file page. This one in particular, though, like it sounded so much like the original track that one thing I did once I, it was in here like this, I started listening to it, the vocal quite a bit and changed these notes up so it's following a little bit more of the chord progression of the hook and moving away from the reference because or else it was sounding way too carbon copy. -y. In terms of the sound, doing something weird here. So what I did is I found a little slice of the, of, of the song where the synth was playing by itself and I dropped it into this program called Synplant. Uh, we're not going to update it right now. And basically it'll use AI to come up with a bunch of variations to try to listen to the audio and then recreate it with a synth patch. It does not sound usually super close, but it sounds really interesting. And sometimes it does sound close enough. So use that to get the sound there. And then we're just removing some lows, a little bit of side chain. So it's pumping a little saturation. So it's coming out a bit more and a little grittier and then some width to push to the left and right. This one is pushed a little bit to the right. And then I added a bunch of different layers here. So let's kind of move through to the next one, which sounds like this. And let's solo it. Sounds so freaking cool. I really love this. So um, I don't know exactly what's going on. Again, basically, I just copied over this. Once I got this first one done, I was able to use this as like a kind of template. And then add for each layer, I could just kind of adjust it. There's some kind of like cool harmony. I don't know what it is, but you can have a look at this. I don't really care too much about like specific music theory stuff. Um, it's just as long as it sounds good, it is good, really. So like even just moving the notes around can work and setting the scale to be in the same scale in Ableton can give you some guiding points there. But that's kind of a look at that in terms of the sound. I think I was just looking up like house organs on um, Splice and I found this sound here, which is really cool. And then if you have it in a simpler like this, it'll actually play chromatically to the MIDI notes. So that's cool. Add in this Ableton shifter device and drop it down an octave and then dialed in the dry and wet. So it's kind of adding like an additional layer there and some character. I'm moving some lows, a little sustain, so the sound's a bit tighter, side chain, so it's pumping and, and making room for the kick and the snare, and uh, or the kick and the bass, and then a little bit of um, this width to push it to the left and right. Then what we're going to get into is a little bit more of some of these audio loops, so let's have a listen to this first one. Solo it out. So what that is, is kind of like a guitar. So I was hearing a guitar on the reference track, and so I was kind of emulating that and wanted to make it sound a little bit more weirder and unique. So I found this weird sample on Splice, uh, and then I did a little bit of, of effects to it. So we're removing a bunch of the lows, so it's really more textural, uh, just keeping some of the highs. This crystallizer effect, which is my favorite plugin from Sound Toys, it just adds that weird little kind of crystally delay sound. A little of the space echo and then some side chain so it's pumping really a lot of a textural effect in this one here and the next is this kind of string sound so what 
So it's really just a, like a string sample that I found on Splice. It's kind of that house strings effect, one main, one note of a string being played. It's really cool uh, and classic, I'd say. Uh, so I just found that, removed some lows, a uh, little side chain, so it's pumping and throwing some crystallizer, so it's adding some that unique little crystally weirdness to it, which I really love. And then just dialing it in because I do believe that sound is in there. And then the next element I added was this. Let's solo it. So this, I don't know if that's as much in the reference track. I was trying to like make it a little bit more unique to me by adding it, making it, the string sound a little bit more orchestral. Um, so I just found this kind of same thing looking in splice within the, the same key. So it would show me stuff that when you're like listening in splice, you can hear it in context and it's like, cool, this is going to work. Uh, proving a little bit of lows, a little bit of side chain, nothing too crazy here. Just kind of work through the rest of these. What we have is this one here. So basically it's another string sound, a little bit lower. It has this cool like retro vintage kind of sound. Again, kind of starting to more take things in my own direction at this point. Listen to this next element. Okay, I think all of this, actually, let's have a quick listen. This. Okay, so this is uh, like a structural kind of thing. So this all comes in around, I think, here. Over here, solo it. And the next one. And the next one. And this is all basically like I wanted the last drop to like hit real hard and I wanted to pull the vocals. This was me taking it a completely different direction, basically. So I won't go over it too much because it doesn't have too much to do with the reference track, but it does, I think, is an important lesson where the idea is like you hear something and you're building up the reference, like take it in a new direction, especially once you've kind of got that core bass elements down. Like you have like the the main melodic bit, the main drums and the main bass. Start going crazy with it and like get your own sound going on with it. Uh, next, let's go over the bass. I'm not going to lie. I feel like this is in a particularly different order. I think I might have did, for your context, I believe I got this like main hook down first. And then I used that. And then I created the bass. And then I started kind of getting crazy with all these additional layers. I didn't get this far without the bass, I don't think. So let's have a listen to the bass. So that's kind of a look at like the there's a the A pattern and then the B pattern, just a slight change in the chord progression. Uh, basically, just flicking back and forth between this and the reference is how I found these th this pattern. Um, and then I won't go too into the bass because I have a full video on how I approach this. But basically, the idea is I start with the sub and just listen to the sub. So it's almost like you're building out. You can really pay attention to the notes. It's almost like you're using a piano or a guitar, uh, and really focus on getting the notes down and then building it from like the sub upwards so first making sure that the, that real deep low end is dialed in as much as it can be and then you're slowly adding in like things like saturation to get the low mid sounding good and then you can add in additional like mid bass layers i usually prefer a bass guitar um to add that like more mid bass character and it's going to pump out through the speakers a little bit more and adds that that uniqueness and character and vibe to your bass sound so in this instance uh, that's a look at the pattern. I'm using my standard little um, sine wave sub with additional saturation added on here. And then I'm using a bass guitar that I've used. And then uh, in one point, I added an additional little like sustained uh, bass sound to it. So that's a look at all of that. If you want a better idea of how I approach the bass, it's the same all the time. There's a video in the project file and again in the playlist if you want to check that out. Um, so then we're almost done here. That's a look at basically the idea. So what I'll usually do is build it out vertically like this, kind of create that or that that main core eight or sixteen bar loop that's going to have almost everything that the song will ever need in it. So it's uh, then it's because then it's all all just subtraction. It's super easy. So let me explain what I mean. So we're gonna go back into the project file now. So back in the project file here, the idea is once you have that main loop, it can be really fast to finish the song. So what I'll have is this like structure track in here. So I'll listen to the track and use these empty MIDI clips to figure out all the different big changes in the song. So we have that in here and you saw it in the Ableton file. So that's the main thing here. Step one, structure track. Step two, having that split monitoring. So being able to flick back and forth between the reference and what you have 
so that you can make decisions while building the layers. You can also do that while you're going through each one of these sections to see what the original artist had or didn't have in these sections and kind of use that as a jumping off point to emulate that. And then again, this is a really big point. You're going to want to make creative liberties, like start off by following the, the main structure, because if by following along like this, you can get the structure done in like 10 minutes. Um, particularly, I would say stuff like the breaks and some of the drops, that's where you're going to want to get a little bit more original, but you can get like a basic building block done very quickly. And then the, th the third step here is to add transition effects, things like crashes, um, reverse crashes, laser sounds, uplifter, noise drops, and stuff like that. If you want to see any information on these, structure tracks, split monitoring, and transitions, on the project file page here, you can open this up. It'll have a dedicated video on how to do that. And then the last step is to just finish the track, just three simple steps. First is the three things rule. Uh, this is a simple idea where look at the top three bigger picture changes. Once you have like the structure done and the song's more or less like getting pretty close to done, what are the three things that would make the biggest impact on the listener? So you you don't want to do things like I want to tune or I want to EQ the kick a bunch. Like would the listener actually notice that or are you missing like the last drop isn't hitting hard enough and you might need to add an additional like synth or something like that. Those bigger impact changes is where I really want you to focus your attention. Then things like 80-20 mixing. So that would really be like focusing on those, the, like the three things, getting the pattern, getting the sound selection and the volume. The volume is the most important thing. And then using that like channel strip to make those small little changes along the way, using the reference track. So as you're building up the track, it's sounding as good as possible. And then lastly, just some five minute mastering. So there's a little bit of like bus processing and a simple mastering chain that I'll always do. And I'm going to make a video on that as soon as I can. But for now, this is kind of where we're at. And I'll add that in here when I can. These project file pages are going to be continually evolving as I add more of these individual templates. And also, if you join the list, even just on like the free list, uh, these are all going to be available to anybody that is on the list for each one of these pages as I'm building them out. Um, the only thing is you have to be on the paid membership if you actually want to download the project files. But yeah, I think that's a good look at this one. And we'll do a recap of the 80-20 rule so you can apply this as succinctly as possible to your own productions. Hi, my friend. Matt from Best Friends Club here. And if you've been paying attention to this super long video, then you've probably figured out what the 80-20 rule is when it comes to building out your songs. The goal here is to get 80% of the result with only 20% of the time, energy, and effort. And because the first key to the 80-20 rule here is to use a reference track, we're making sure that we're very easily hitting 80% of a high quality, professionally made song. In particular, we use that reference track to make sure that we're picking the right notes, sounds, and volumes as we're building out our song. The second key of the 80-20 rule here is to mix as you go in an extremely streamlined way by only focusing on the volume of each track, as well as using a simple repeatable channel strip for each track that we're adding to our songs. The third and final key is to repurpose your old project files and have a suite of powerful templates, Ableton racks, and one knob effects that you've personalized and curated over time. If you'd like to get a head start by downloading all the racks, templates, and all the files that you've seen me use in the Ableton project file for this video, or if you'd just like to take a closer look at any of the techniques or tracks you saw me work on in this video at your own pace, you can find a link to this video's project files on screen now and at the second link that's in the YouTube description. I'm recreating a different song from the Beatport top charts every single week and making the project files available to anyone who wants them. You'll also get access to a private Discord where you can ask me and the community questions as well as shared tracks for feedback. If you or your music are not quite ready for a shot in the arm like that, I've also made you a completely free bundle of templates, samples, and special bonuses that have helped me figure out how to completely finish one new song each and every single week. And you can grab that free Ultimate Song Finishing Toolkit by visiting the first link that's in the YouTube description here. However, if you just feel like staying on YouTube for now, that's totally fine. Save that link for later and check out this playlist filled with videos just like the one you just watched where I completely create songs inspired by tracks found in the Beatport top charts. Or if you really want to take what you've learned in this video to the next level, make sure you check out this video right here.